This is going to be a fun topic and uh, obviously read your piece from, I don't know, it was like two days ago or, or, or uh, very recent. So obviously super topical, uh, you know, across the board. Um, I just want to give it a sec here while people kind of filter in as well. Um, but uh, maybe uh, just a quick question for you. How, how has the reaction been to your most recent piece? Well, um, it, yeah, it was actually really just designed to be a rebuttal to Joe Smith's blog about Bitcoin yeah. emissions, and uh, it blew up more than I expected. Uh, I think people like that I pulled in, you know, real data on China's grid, which uh, I hadn't seen yeah, that before. before. So I, I, I was trawling through the archives of <laughs> Chinese grid data, which was on a province by province basis, which was pretty hard to find. Uh, yeah, people people liked it for the most part. Of course, you know, you, know, you, you get the mixed reactions, but uh, that's anything, anything you produce will get, you know, criticism yeah. and so on. Of course. Hey, Melton, welcome. Hi, hey, guys. Melton. It's good to be here. Uh, it's my favorite slash least favorite um, discussion. <laughs> as well, I, I, actually, I think it's... As yeah, someone actually ahead. worked in the energy industry, like to Nick's point, um, what he talked about in his article and something I shared in in a session I did um, Real Vision last, last Monday, like, I don't think people realize the issue we're talking about here isn't the use of energy. We use energy for a lot of different things, a lot of different things. The issue isn't the fact that we use energy. The issue is sources of energy. And Bitcoin is one arguably very small industry does not, does not dictate how energy is produced. Policy dictates how energy is produced. Um, and I think today is actually a really timely day to be having this conversation because the Biden administration just rolled out, you know, their absolutely insane <laughs> infrastructure spending plan. Um, if we want to talk about moving towards decarbonization and a less carbon intensive energy grid, we need to talk about investing in renewables. And the fact of the matter is, is that in the last year alone in 2020, China added more renewable generation to their grid than all other countries in the world combined. That's incredible scale. And so, yeah. yeah, and the fact of the matter is, right, 20% of China's energy grid comes from renewables. At more renewable production in the United States, the U.S. is at about 9% renewables on the energy grid. China's at about 20% as of 2020. The other thing is China has invested very heavily in the manufacturing of solar panels, of solar inverters, battery technology. And now I think there's this massive, massive, really interesting political battle underway where Western nations who want to decarbonize and add renewables to their grid have to procure parts and equipment from China. <laughs> and so right. the issue is extremely nuanced and extremely complex. But what I think is absolutely fucking preposterous, and I'm going to go ahead and be incendiary because I can on this forum, is this. In the United States of America, the CAFE standards, which dictate the fuel efficiency of cars, cars are one of the largest sources of fuel of carbon emissions in the United States of America. The CAFE standards have not really changed since 1997. 1997. <laughs> and yet we have a group of people in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere who all of a sudden have a tremendous issue with the fact that Bitcoin uses energy. Like, I, I feel like we're living in clown world. There are so many places where we can begin to decarbonize. And I think inherently, like most Bitcoin mining trends towards renewable energy and other very low cost yeah. sources of standard energy. But we're talking about the wrong Thing. And that's really the issue I have. If we want to talk about decarbonization, we have to talk about sources of energy, which requires better policy. So I'll just pause there. But I, I'd like to have this yeah. discussion. I mean, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, you know, it's a great framing, and I want to, I want to explore that because there's, there's the, 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 the sort of what are the macro policy issues, and sort of what's the, 
relative focus that people should have in different dimensions of energy usage and so on. But um, maybe um, I want to frame a couple things, you know, here at the at the at the top too, which is obviously, you know, we we, we have this phenomenon of incredible growth in crypto and crypto adoption. We have this phenomenon of obviously very significant growth in the monetized value of, of Bitcoin's outstanding. Um, and, and obviously it, it's an enormous industry and, and the industry of operators that provide the, you know, the infrastructure to secure that network is also growing enormously. And so there's a lot of attention on this. And I think people are looking for, you know, v- various forms of policy perspectives on this. And, and obviously I, I'm bringing you guys on here because I think you both bring I think very detailed and nuanced perspectives on the reality here. Um, and I, and I think it's not something that most people just sort of take for granted popular press. They take for granted what, you know, someone, you know, the, the kind of throwaway comments and FUD and, and other things. And as we know, it's significantly more, uh, you know, more detailed. And we're going to get into some of those details because there's amazing work that's being done on this, including for both of you. Um, you know, it, uh, I want to share a little tidbit, which is a little known fact about Circle, which is when when Sean and I were starting Circle in, in early 2013, we looked at a bunch of different businesses um, and, and we, we had a theory that, you know, you might actually want to run mining operations if you're going to run a payment infrastructure around this. And so we actually, you know, we, we actually almost started operating a kind of industrial scale mining you know, in infrastructure. And I think the really noteworthy thing is, you know, back then, a lot of the people who were thinking about this were thinking about energy efficiency. Um, and so, like a bunch of folks, we were specking out data centers in, you know, the, you know, near the North Pole. We were looking at um, renewable energy sources, geothermal sources. Uh, we were looking at, uh, you know, cooling solutions um, that would allow this to be essentially as energy efficient as possible because the conclusion that I had reached, you know, very early on was that as Bitcoin achieved mass market scale and as it became a, a, you know, a, a really significant kind of reserve currency status asset that naturally the, the, the process of mining it would kind of tend towards the most energy efficient form uh, that it could find in the world. And so there was almost like this frontier of like thermodynamics that would converge with the securing of this asset. And, and it's interesting to see what has transpired since, right? We, we ended up punting on that. <laughs> we didn't do it. We didn't do it um, Jeremy, in part it's be- never too late. It's never too yeah, late. Yeah, no, clearly. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, people are financing these things with SPACs. I mean, why not? So, uh, you know, clearly, clearly it's, it's, it's still a very, very large commercial opportunity for a lot of people. But, you know, the, the, but my point here is, is just that I always felt that the long-term destiny of Bitcoin and of, of similar proof of work infrastructures was towards, would actually lead to probably many of the most important breakthroughs in in, in energy efficiency in the world mm. and that there's a long-term ultimate industrial convergence between the the growth of this network and energy efficiency and most people when i would say this would look to look to me like you're out of your mind like what are you talking about you know there's all these coal-fired plants in china and this is you're, you're just out of your mind and, and and really that thud started then um and now as Bitcoin takes on a greater role and as proof of work networks themselves just continue to, to scale, um, there's, there's, there's even more being thrown at this. And these are really immediate issues. Sorry, Jeremy, because, though, yeah. sorry, can, can we make just a quick distinction now? Um, you keep referring to proof of work. Is the implication here that um, other forms of consensus don't have the same issues? No, not at all. I mean, I, I think okay. we, should, we should explore that tonight because yeah, I, I, I'd like I to clearly think so. That. Yeah. 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 And I think, again, some of what you articulated, if I could just draw a slight parallel, which I think is an interesting one as we get into other types of consensus and just compute and connectivity more broadly. Yeah. Um, if we look at how um, the Internet peering space and data center space started, right, like 
people used to run their own bare metal. <laughs> and then company, companies like Equinix, right, which is now a $70 billion company, um, started to provide enterprises with large-scale hosting services and helping them find co-location services and host equipment and build enterprise-grade redundant infrastructure to host and run and manage their footprint in a more efficient and streamlined way. And then that industry started to grow and you saw the emergence of you know, data center giants and a huge, huge market for cloud compute and, and cloud-based um, services. Now you see many large corporates not only consuming tremendous amounts of compute and it being one of their largest line items, it's actually going to be one of the largest line items for the defense industry as well, which I think is really interesting. Just today was announced the U.S. military procured $22 billion in VR equipment from Microsoft. Last year, they awarded over $18 billion in cloud compute contracts via two large RFQs, um, but also corporates started buying carbon offsets to offset the footprint of their compute right. usage, right? So I don't think the trend of us using compute services goes away. Um, Not at all. No, clearly, clearly. Yeah. It, it, it's enormous. And, and I, I think you touched on something that I, I think Nick has written about as well. And is one of the things that I, I sort of was including in the kind of concept and description here that I want to talk about too, which is when we think about an economic system and we think about a currency and what secures the value of that currency. There's a lot <laughs> right. there, right? We're not just talking about like what, what are the pipes cost, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, I think everyone fundamentally understands that, you know, at the end of World War II, there was a, a, a geopolitical situation and that geopolitical situation had to do with control over energy reserves. And there was a kind of carving up of energy reserves and the U.S. was the winner and the U.S. was able to dictate a, an economic system that was the dollar-based economic system um, and, and ultimately on a fundamental global economic liquidity was based on dollar-priced oil and then the securing of the oil reserves in the Middle East. And, I mean, this is obviously sort of very well understood, but you know, underpaying... <laughs> It carry, you know, infrastructure that has has been there supporting it. So we should be thinking about what is the energy cost of that. Um, and Nick, I know you've written about this. I'd love to hear you share at a high level. That's kind of a, a it's a little bit of a geopolitical macro thesis on this, but it's actually real and very important that when we think about the energy footprint of a currency or of an economic system. It's deeper than just, you know, what was what, what pipes that people are using. Totally. Yeah. And I think about the petrodollar system, but it's it's just a fact, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's no conspiracy. <laughs> and, it's obviously just the world order as it's been. It, for it, a sound, long time. <laughs> it sounds conspiratorial to say the US provides military support to the Saudis and in exchange you know, against Saudi enemies, including the Houthis, right? Those are Raytheon missiles. Um, and in exchange, you know, the Saudis agree to sell oil exclusively for dollars and recycle those profits into U.S. treasuries, and thus backstopping the value of the dollar and providing a buyer for our debt. That sounds like a conspiracy, but it's true. <laughs> and, you know, when when we had the Nixon shock and we needed to find a way to stabilize the value of the dollar after the 70s, that was the system we settled on. Was that tried to sell their commodities for something that's not dollars, those individuals, their regimes were toppled. Gaddafi and Saddam, both of them, um, tried to sell oil for something other than dollars. And we, we invaded them. Um, so the military order here is an inextricable part of the dollar system. And of course, the U.S. military is the single largest institutional consumer of energy on the planet. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's a little more diffuse. It's kind of hard to say the dollar is literally backed by oil. But the global dollar infrastructure is certainly part of the reason that the U.S., accounts for about 50% of global military spend. Uh, it's because, you know, we maintain that dollar system through soft and right. hard power. And 
it takes a lot of resources to do right. that. I mean, it, it is the trade settlement currency um, for a lot of different reasons, but a very significant one of those is the the the, the sort of nexus of energy commodity pricing and the the role that and the, and the sort of uh, kind of privilege that that provides to to the United States and obviously uh, uh, a, a broader agenda that that uh, you know uh, aligns with uh, with enforcing that so I mean I, I think it's not it's it, it shouldn't be lost on anyone this isn't this is just the fact of how our global political and economic system has worked largely since World War II and, and very much since the 70s. And um, so I, I don't want to go too long on this topic because I, I think it is one component of the debate. But if we're doing an apples to apples, when we think about what actually backs a currency system, what actually secures it, what actually allows it to hold its value, um, and, and what is the energy footprint of that? We, we have to do that comparison. Uh, it is not, it's well, not reasonable not to. If I might, Jeremy, if we just extend that um, analogy or, or that, you know, narrative a bit further. Um, my thesis, I left the energy in 2013. And in 2015, I joined the Bitcoin industry full time, which was one of my best decisions, actually probably the single best decision I've made in my life. Um, I think one of the really interesting trends that is now unfolding on the macro stage that most people don't appreciate is oil and petrochemicals are no longer going to define the shape of the world to come. What will define the shape of the world to come is semiconductors, compute, and a new form of energy in the form of renewables, right? As renewables right. grow in terms of their share of the energy grid. Again, what I think is really important to underscore here and what you and Nick have both touch, touched on with, with this idea of power, money, energy, and the military industrial complex all being tightly wound together is in a world where petrochemicals no longer dominate and the war machine and physical violence no longer dominates, the current monetary system becomes less relevant i.e. the U.S. dollar becomes less relevant. So I think there's a, a larger narrative here. Um, if we look at where semiconductor fab happens today, it's not the United States or Western Europe. If we look at where renewable energy generation happens en masse and where that hardware is produced and where that intellectual property is largely being utilized, it's not in the U.S. and it's not in Western Europe. So I think from an in investment perspective, um, you know, we see now initiatives to invest in this type of infrastructure in the United States and to right. onshore it. Um, but I and, and we've got an infrastructure bill that's aimed, aimed at, at parts of this, obviously. Uh, my, my question is, should the infrastructure bill include a strategic imperative for North America to be building the yes. best possible crypto mining infrastructure in the world. That's exactly with, 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 that's exactly what I want to lobby for, Jeremy. I think yeah. any infrastructure spending plan should include, number one, incentives for more renewables capacity build and incentives for North American Bitcoin mining um, to help bring those facilities online by making it economic in the near to midterm for those facilities um, to, to be economically viable, right? It takes a long time uh, for for enough consumptive demand to get built around locations where, where this energy supply is. Um, so I actually think it's one of the better investments we could be making. Now, will it happen? I don't know. But again, I think there are a number of industry efforts <laughs> underway that I'm excited to be working on to yeah. try to um, sort of highlight this opportunity and to try to ensure that any bill, um, you know, incorporates um, Bitcoin as a potential industry uh, that can help accelerate the build out of energy infrastructure as well as more resilient compute infrastructure. Right. Different states, different cities in different parts of the United States where there is in, in, a, in effect a form of industrial policy that's being executed in a localized way to support the development of energy efficient infrastructure in the crypto mining space. And so we're, we have pockets of that, but it you know, it, it has not risen to the, the the national level nor the national security level, but but maybe we're on the cusp of that. I think the best people to make it happen um, are probably in this, this <laughs> clubhouse room. And so, um, 
you know, I, I think this industry, you know, Jeremy, I've had the pleasure of working with you since since 2015. You know, I, I think the industry has always been very forward thinking, has organized and, you know, both existential threats and just narrative threats. Um, so I think the first step will be the industry self-organizing. And I think right now there are a number of really cool efforts underway to at least um, create uh, a, a pledge or consensus amongst participants mm-hmm. in the Bitcoin ecosystem to drive towards a carbon neutral um, sort of approaches by 2030 and to fully mitigate um, the carbon footprint of the industry, you know, in line with the, the Paris Climate Accord dot timeline, which is 2030. And I also right. think, look, just like in the data center space, large corporates are purchasing carbon credits to offset their compute consumption. There's no reason that large corporates and endowments who are concerned about ESG mandates can't also purchase carbon credits to offset any potential concerns they have about Bitcoin's carbon footprint. Like this is no different. So I'm just, I find it very curious that Bitcoin somehow gets a different moral treatment, which I think again goes back to there's a difference between an argument about usage of energy versus sources of energy. And the fact of the matter is there is no electricity police because energy economics and market pricing dictates how energy is consumed. I I want to turn to you, Nick. Your piece that just came out, which was was a rebuttal, um, but included some, I think, incredible data I mean, you're making a lot of points here, um, but but maybe just start level for about this discussion of uh, unused energy, the alignment of 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 mining infrastructure with unused energy, um, and actually what we understand from the actual data about that in this industry today, and and what we can infer from that. Uh, maybe we'll just start there. Yeah, one thing I really tried to convey in that piece, and it, it's called, uh, it's a pun basically, the title is Noah Objectivity on Bitcoin Mining. It's, um, I'm riffing on No Opinion, which is the title of Noah Smith's blog. Uh, so if you want to look that up, that's on Medium. So basically the point I was really trying to make is that it's not a coincidence that A, a lot of Bitcoin is mined in China, and B, a lot of Bitcoin is mined in four Chinese provinces specifically. It wasn't open based Bitcoin and the three arts of a map and said, okay, we're going to mine in Sichuan, Yunnan, Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia. There's a very specific reason they chose to mine there. And we know from, from the data that that's basically where the overwhelming majority of Chinese Bitcoins are mined is those four provinces. And the reason is, and I went through and looked at the province level grid data. The reason is there is a massive overabundance of energy in each of those four provinces and those four provinces specifically and not other Chinese provinces. And if you look at some of the maps I put together, it'll be extremely apparent to you. And the reason there's an overabundance is because China overbuilt their energy infrastructure. They built too much wind and um, solar. And in the southwest parts of China, there's tons of rivers and they built enormous amounts of dams. And all those four provinces are really distant from the big population centers, which are mostly on the east coast of China. They're thousands of miles away from those population centers. And as we all know, electricity doesn't travel very well. So Bitcoin emerged, you know, 2016, 2017, it really emerged. Bitcoin mining became this big industry. At a time, 2016 was really the peak when the Chinese energy grid was the most unbalanced it's ever been because of China's um, energy investment, which was way over the top, basically. And they had this enormous problem with curtailment. And I, this might be too much detail, but I really want to drive the point home. Yeah, that's really so, important. Really important. So you got Bitcoin mining in two kinds of provinces. So Sichuan and Yunnan are one kind, basically almost exclusively hydropower. And they just put the water out of the dams because the dams can't accommodate all the water. And there's just not enough power draw from the grid. There's really not that many big cities in Sichuan or Yunnan. Uh, They can export the energy to a certain degree, but again, doesn't 
Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, lots of coal, undeniably, but also 30 to 35 percent wind and solar. People don't know that. Um, so, and, and they also curtail a huge amount of energy. In fact, um, you know, China in, in 2016 curtailed something like 100 terawatt hours of wind and, and solar alone with those, um, with those provinces being uh, the main ones. Uh, and so that's a big part of the reason why uh, you had so much mining happening in those four provinces and China specifically as opposed to anywhere else on Earth. And it's also part of the reason you had other commodities that have high amounts of energy embodiment in them, like aluminum, aluminum smelting. A lot of it happens in Sichuan and Yunnan. So Bitcoin's not the only uh, commodity that's produced uh, that um, settles where the production settles in these places with abundant energy. There's others like Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin is a pure form uh, of aluminum because it has an infinite energy to weight ratio, right? Uh, so this is kind of why Bitcoin ended up in this position. And this is sort of indicative of what I expect to happen. Now China is actually fixing their grid. People don't know this, but they're building in long distance transmission lines um, they're trying to make the grid more balanced to match the supply to the demand. Uh, they're making it easier to export the energy from these provinces. Uh, at the same time, the local authorities also banned Bitcoin mining in, in, in Inner Mongolia, which is great news because that was a fairly coal-driven uh, coal province. So the, the epic of Chinese Bitcoin mining is actually ending, believe it or not. Uh, it's not going to end overnight. But if you trace where the ASICs are being purchased, a lot of American buyers, there's a huge amount of firms in the U.S. now that are engaged in mining. Um, you're seeing Inner Mongolia close down the opportunity. You're seeing the grid become more balanced. And as it does, there's going to be less curtailment and hence less opportunity. And this arbitrage is going to go away. So Bitcoin hash power will just get routed to other locations around the globe where there are these local arbitrages and where there's this abundant energy waiting to be monetized. And so it'll flow to the next location. And I, I believe that a big share of that is the USA. Um, and that was another thing I tried to quantify in the article. Uh, but th there's a lot more work to be done on that. So I'll, I'll take a breather and pause there. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's fascinating. And, and we're seeing, you know, um, you know, various provinces in Canada various states and locales in the United States where there is abundant, uh, you know, abundant energy sources, natural energy sources that, you know, essentially, you know, that there is this fundamental convergence to energy efficiency, right? The, the more energy efficient you are, the more successful you will be securing, you know, securing Bitcoin and, and this network. And, um, uh, again, that's 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 sort of played out over the last five years all over the world, right? There's these incredible stories of of, of how that's that's taking place. Um, I, I'm I'm, in, I'm interested in 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 other anecdotes on on that sort of topic. Um, you know, you know, where are those kind of capital investments going? Uh, what are the yeah, energy storage, energy, you know, c cooling, other technologies that are getting applied here to make this as energy efficient as possible. Well, Melton, you can hop in at any point. One I wanted to point to, and this might be a little controversial, is also something I covered in the piece, which is this, what I call pipe to crypto, basically taking otherwise vented or flared natural gas, which is a byproduct of oil extraction and capturing that and putting it into a generator and using it to mine. Uh, that, in my view, is not positive from a carbon perspective, as long as you assume that that oil extraction is going to happen. If the oil extraction is outlawed or stops, then you know, you're not going to have that excess resource of natural gas. But that's a really interesting way. And I've seen a ton of startups get financed to pursue this opportunity. And that's there's a lot but, of supply in, in Texas, for instance. But but let's be clear, right? The shale gas industry is an economic anomaly. 
Um, and that won't persist forever because the decline curve on a shale well is roughly two years. Um, the issue we have is we have massive U.S. energy companies that are heavily subsidized sitting on massive CapEx assets, i.e. 20 to 30 year mineral rights leases that they secured in the early 20 teens when gas was trading at $14 per million cubic feet. So they're sitting on an economically unviable asset and attempting to minimize the, the damage of owning an economically unproductive asset. I think the more interesting opportunity in my view, um, and uh, I got my own no opinion piece uh, about two months ago, um, I had tweeted, Bitcoin is a money battery. And in fact, I think Bitcoin is one of the most sophisticated batteries the world has ever seen. Um, and I got a lovely lambasting from Noah in his, his newsletter, um, uh, you know, saying, oh, well, how do you take energy out of Bitcoin, which is, you know, quite funny to me because money, I eat in the form of, of gold, really, right? This the shiny rock <laughs> has been the primary means that humanity has had over the last four or five millennia to transmute energy into value, which could be moved across vast distances in terms of both space and, and time. Um, but what I think is really interesting, Nick, what I think you're alluding to is we have to dispel the myth that energy... Um, is 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 finite. And when I say that, I'm not talking about, you know, the laws of thermodynamics. No one's disagreeing with those. I certainly am not. But there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of energy that is accessible, available, but not utilized and cannot be utilized. Um, and so I think the interesting question is, you know, battery technology today is not capable of harnessing and moving that energy to consumption points where it can be utilized. But other forms of energy, i.e. monetary energy, monetary value can allow us to move that energy from places where it's produced to places where it can be consumed and utilized in an economically productive way. So what I'd like to see more of is a narrative around where Bitcoin can actually be used as a uh, mean, Bitcoin mining can be used as a means to balance the energy grid. A great example I'll give Jeremy is recently when we had the ice storms in Texas, there was a large mining facility in Texas that had secured a large um, offtake agreement with a local utility. And during that crisis, they were actually able to switch off their miners and direct energy back to the grid for a period of several days, right, when energy was needed. So in this capacity, because Bitcoin miners can be switched on and off, they become very good tools at balancing energy grids, um, particularly because base load demand and peak load demand are often quite far apart. We build our energy grid around peak demand, yet most times we can only monetize the base load demand. And so I think Bitcoin miners, you know, you can switch them off in an instant. A combined cycle gas plant or a coal-fired plant, it takes you two to three days to power that up or down. You're not necessarily able to cycle it on or off. I think Bitcoin mining uh, can be a great addition to the energy grid to help balance some of these peaks and troughs in, in demand. So I think that's a great example. Um, the second example I'll add that goes a bit beyond Bitcoin's energy use, but goes a bit more into the thermodynamics of Bitcoin, is I just invested in a really cool company that is actually utilizing the heat generated by Bitcoin mining to fuel industrial processes and centralized heating grids. Now, in many Nordic countries, um, the energy grid has uh, this thing called district energy, which is centralized heating. So, for example, in Vancouver and places in Norway and other Nordic countries, there's a tremendous amount of electricity that's burned by these small scale district energy plants that are one to two megawatts that generate centralized heat um, for a city or for an industrial process or for office buildings. And so you're basically just burning electricity <laughs> to produce heat as the output. And what this company, Mint Green, has done is they've put uh, Bitcoin miners 
inside of this immersion cooled keg, um, sorry, this immersion liquid keg. And what they're doing is thermodynamic exchange. It has about 97% efficiency where they're actually able to capture the heat that's generated by Bitcoin mining and pipe it into the district energy grid meaning that um, they're able to actually effectively monetize Bitcoin's heat generating capacity. And in fact, in Norway, there's now a bill that's being contemplated for data centers, which would require data centers to harvest the heat that is produced in these data centers and to pipe it back into the district energy grid and into the centralized heating grid. So I think there are a lot of interesting ways um, that we could think about you know, utilizing Bitcoin not just um, in isolation, but in conjunction with other localized specific energy needs that just happen to also exist in places where there is a tremendous drive towards a zero carbon um, sort of footprint uh, by year 2030. Yeah. So um, those are just two examples I'll share. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, those are fascinating. In fact, there was last week, I, I saw an announcement of a startup. I should have brought the name for, 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 the, for the podcast here, but it, it, it's a startup that basically is, is building consumer space heaters that, uh, that use the heat generated from mining, you know, for space heat. <laughs> I mean, basically, um, and <laughs> I think Jesse from Hoddle Ranch has a hot tub powered by Bitcoin miners. He calls it yeah. Spa 256. <laughs> Spa 256. Nice. That's awesome. Um, I, I actually want I want to talk about, uh, thermodynamics here for a second, because, you know, uh, recently, obviously, Bill Gates has been, you know, very emphatically saying that we need to embrace nuclear power at scale um, as a critical component of the future of energy in the world. Um, And I think there are a, a lot of scientists who believe that nuclear power actually is critical alongside our investments in renewable energy sources, um, you know, uh, from an energy efficiency perspective, nuclear power has a a number of ramifications, but at what point are we seeing nuclear powered uh, Bitcoin mining? Well, I'm a huge nuclear power bull. I mean, I think as Milton said at the beginning of the episode, this the solution ultimately lies in policy choices. And unfortunately, nuclear has been de-emphasized from a policy perspective, uh, not just in the U.S., but in places like Germany, too, where they decommissioned a bunch of high-end nuclear plants after Fukushima, which really made very little sense. It was kind of a populist move. And I think it was an absolute tragedy because their grid quality declined subsequently and, and the carbon intensity of their grid increased. Uh, They had to rely on more fossil fuels. The interesting thing about nuclear is that it's incredibly predictable and static. Um, Whereas if you look at curtailed sources of energy, uh, like hydro or renewables, uh, wind and solar are much less predictable. And so they have this waxing and waning pattern that means that you know, maybe Bitcoin could be there to mop up the excess and act as that energy sponge. That wouldn't be the case with nuclear, but at maturity, you know, perhaps the grid would just be far more nuclear and then we would have mining on grid. Right. Um, so I, I, it does have to be part of the energy strategy. I, I don't see our grid functioning solely based on renewables. That doesn't seem right. that, that viable mm-hmm. to me. I just augment that as well. Um, I think there are a number of interesting startups that are working in this this space. Um, I've done a few clubhouses as well as um, a recent Real Vision event with one of them called Oaklo, which is building um, small scale nuclear power generators that can be used um, in microgrid applications. I think one of the more interesting trends um, that I'd like to see that I actually think Bitcoin lends itself well to is smaller scale grids um, helping make up more resilient energy infrastructure that is less dependent on really large but also really fragile (laughs) energy infrastructure like pipelines, large transmission systems, etc. I think um, as 
as energy systems and energy grids grow in complexity and in scale, it becomes more and more challenging to have centralized coordination. And we've seen this in a number of instances whenever a hurricane hits the Gulf Coast and shuts down you know, um, Freeport, Louisiana, which is the primary hub for net gas import and exports in the U.S. when it shuts down Henry Hub, which is the primary hub for net gas in, in the U.S., uh, net gas transport, right? It has ripple effects throughout the U.S. So I think what's interesting about nuclear um, solar in particular as, as a renewable and other forms of small scale generation and being able to put those assets on the grid and monetize putting them on the grid through Bitcoin mining, <laughs> potentially, yeah. um, is it can help drive us towards, you know, we, we joke in Bitcoin about this idea of the citadel, but I think as a, a, a high level concept, right, this idea of smaller units of organization are actually highly relevant, especially in our global energy infrastructure. Um, and so what I think is really interesting, right, is Bitcoin starts to now intersect with a number of different uh, sectors. My belief is, you know, Bitcoin and the energy sector should be best friends. I'm trying to make lots of friendships in the nuclear energy space because I actually think nuclear energy, as Nick alluded to, is a much yep. maligned and very misunderstood industry, much like ours. And then ultimately, I think from a geopolitical perspective and a military industrial perspective and a, a national security perspective, we actually have a great incentive to move towards localized, less centralized, more resilient energy infrastructure that isn't so dependent um, and so sort of vulnerable to these potential um, threats, both natural threats as well as threats from state and non-state actors. So I actually think there's a, you know, a larger narrative here around decentralization of yeah. our energy grid. That's really fascinating, especially when you get start to get into um, small scale nuclear generation capacity. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I mean, I, I've, I, I've, I've been tracking some of the same things and uh, I, I think it is not often discussed um, and, and, and certainly needs to be, which maybe, you know, as you talk about policy implications, we started off a little bit talking about this, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, from an alignment of these different industries perspective, from a strategic competitive perspective, you know, what does, you're, you're, you're the, uh, the U.S. Senate, you're the House of Representatives, you're the Biden administration, what does a, an infrastructure policy that actually embrace, embraces this at a at a national economic infrastructure perspective, from a national green energy perspective, from a national security perspective, what do the policies look like? What should we be articulating as an industry in Washington right now? Um, I, I can take that one first and then pass it to Nick. Um, it's interesting. I've been speaking to a number of congressional staffers. Um, and as you know, um, staffers are really the ones that are educating our, our representatives and congressmen and women on different issues and topics. I think right now the most important thing we need to do is help dispel the myth that uh, Bitcoin is destroying the environment. <laughs> this particular administration is very um, sensitive to and has made several very public statements about its intent to focus on sustainability issues and ESG issues from a variety of perspectives, but especially in the corporate sector. So I think the number one is making it clear that our industry is not the enemy, but actually we can be a part of the solution. And then I think number two is ensuring that in any infrastructure spending bill that emerges, we can start to create federal mandates um, to provide tax incentives uh, to companies that are engaging in Bitcoin mining and um, encourage them, you know, to establish themselves in, in the United States. Um, I think it's really important for the security of the Bitcoin network. I think it's really important as more and more American corporations, American institutions, <laughs> American insurance companies add Bitcoin to their balance. 
their personal sort of investment portfolios. So I think we really need to help sort of show um, a, a path to Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin infrastructure being a, a core part of maintaining the security of the U.S.'s financial um, system, right? And, and Bitcoin is becoming increasingly financialized. I think it would be a mistake to neglect that fact. But I think step one right now is to really defang some of yeah. the loudest critics, because I do think there is consistent misperception out there. And there are a lot of people who are intent on fear-mongering or somehow pushing this narrative that Bitcoin needs to be banned or something needs to be done around Bitcoin's energy usage. Um, so I think yeah. step one is really de defanging it. Um, and then step two is being in those conversations and showing where and how infrastructure investments can be made. I mean, it seems like I agree with all that. Uh, and it, seem, it seems like a big piece of this is, is, is even you go up a level from, you know, talking about the alignment of interests on long-term energy efficiency and, and, and competitiveness of economic infrastructure. You know, I think we're really at a moment right now, and this isn't just in the United States, this is with national governments all around the world who are confronting the reality of a global new form of global digital commodity money. And this is here. It's here to stay. It is scaling. It is monetizing. It will be many trillions of dollars of monetization as we go forward. And so I think there is a, a higher order issue. And I don't expect this to come from Jerome Powell or Janet Yellen. Uh, but there is a higher level issue, which is having the leaders, not just in the United States, but in other governments, understand that you know, non-sovereign digital commodity money is here and it's not going away. And if it is here and it's not going away, what role do individual governments want to have in, have interacting with that? There's the put your head in the sand and just wish it goes as a, wish it goes away. There's your, you know, let's just, we, we're going to try and ban the internet basically and hopefully it'll go away. But I mean, really we're talking about a, a much broader level of, understanding, comprehension, and acceptance. Um, and if you can get to that level of understanding and acceptance, then I think the discussion shifts very quickly to, oh, what are we going to do to be competitive here? And what are we going to do to be part of securing the infrastructure? What are we going to do to align infrastructure incentives for this new significant form of global economic activity? And so I I'd be interested in your reactions to, to that. Well, I'll I'll just add. I mean, I'm not in contact with uh, with staffers on the hill as uh, at all, frankly. Um, but what I would emphasize to them is that Bitcoin is a utility, like any other. It's just dematerialized in terms of what it produces. It's not physical, but that doesn't mean it's not real, and it doesn't have genuine utility uh, to you know millions of people and firms globally. And um, there's plenty of industries out there that consume a huge amount of energy, like the airline industry. Airlines buy carbon offsets, and you know that's considered normal, um, and that's an acceptable trade-off in society. Uh, you produce something useful, and, and you consume energy to put, to produce that thing. Um, and the other thing I would emphasize is that as China bans mining and my guess is they'll keep banning mining, um, you know, because they probably take exception to the grid power being used to mine Bitcoin, given that Bitcoin is probably ultimately disruptive to the Chinese state. The U.S. has the opportunity to take the other side of that and become this uh, this underwriter or steward of, of this technology and the suite of technologies. And as it just so happens... A lot of the world's most influential crypto firms and developers and users are all U.S. based. So the U.S. has been handed this opportunity on a golden platter. Um, I, I don't have the numbers, of course, but I think if you looked at crypto wealth, a huge share of it would be here in the U.S. And a lot of the custodians are here in the U.S., even here in Boston, frankly. Um, so there's just such an enormous opportunity 
to be a neutral underwriter of this technology. And I think the U.S. doesn't have that much to fear from the free flow of capital, unlike other countries that have a managed exchange rate and that have capital controls. So that's something that always puzzled me was the resistance to this asset. If the U.S. is in a strong position, what do they have to fear from an asset that's one-tenth the size of gold, ultimately? Right. All right, we're, we're, uh, we're going to wrap in about 10 minutes, but I want to see if there are some questions from folks. I saw someone raise their hand. I'm going to add you up here, Mustafa. And, um, and then anyone else who wants to jump in with a question, please feel free to, to come online. Oh, we lost you. All right, uh, adding JP. Hey, Nick, and how's it going? Appreciate the talk, guys. It's been a great on the Bitcoin mining front. Definitely want to understand what your thoughts are and how we can help change the industry perspective that why Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment, specifically here in the U.S., maybe how we can get capital partners behind it for advertising and PR campaigns to change that message. Well, frankly, I think the facts are in our favor. It's just that we have to do a better job of exposing the facts. Um, there is a lot that mitigates the mining story. Certainly Bitcoin is mined with some coal and some fossil fuels, but there's just a lot of good that's happening in mining. And I think the progressive change in mining, if you look at where hash power is migrating over the next kind of 24 months, that is incredibly positive. And it's just a matter of time until those developments become clear. But the number one thing I'm trying to do right now is it basically expose the facts surrounding mining and, and see about, you know, publishing more formal work. Uh, so that's just from my perspective is engaging in education. I don't know. I'm it seems like fun, funding more fundamental research here is obviously is, is important for society. It's important for this industry as well. Melt, I'm sorry, you could no. jump in. Um, yeah, I think um, research is critical. So um, generating the data and the empirical evidence, we've been doing that at CoinShares since 2017. Um, Chris Bendixson on our research team, you know, was, was one of the first to actually put together formal research um, demonstrating that the majority of Bitcoin mining was happening with renewable energy. I think that's a big piece of it. I think the second piece of it that's actually very important is um, what's really interesting about Bitcoin that's so different from any other industry and that frankly makes Bitcoin a target is Bitcoin's very transparent about its energy usage in a manner that no other industry is, which inevitably makes it a target for attack. So I do think it's important for people in the industry to focus on um, you know, the, the facts. The fact is, yes, the Bitcoin network does consume energy. I think um, what we have to steer away from, again, is this is not a conversation about the morality of energy usage. And what I am dismayed often to see is so many of the conversations that are happening online and in various forums are about the morality of energy usage, which has never been the role <laughs> of right. government. Right? That's the role of energy markets. Um, and private industry. So I think it's very important to not get mired in arguments about the morality of energy, but to really focus on sources of energy and how better policy can shift sources of energy. <laughs> so um, again, I think I would just encourage Bitcoiners, you know, don't wrestle with a pig like a, you're going to get covered in mud, and B, the pig likes it. <laughs> like, I see a lot of people engaging in these arguments um, with people who, frankly, don't want to have their minds changed. Um, I don't think that's a worthy exercise. I think, again, it, it needs to be really focused on, on facts. The fact is, like, yes, the Bitcoin net network does consume energy. Yes, um, most of that energy does come from renewables, and, like, yes, we can build a future where Bitcoin and sustainability and ESG mandates are highly compatible. Um, but again, I would encourage people to just stray away from the morality arguments because they're impossible to win. Yeah, that's a gr great, great perspective, Melton. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining. Um, we'd love to hear your question. Jeff, thank you. Um, this question is more geared towards Meltem. In conversations with staffers, um, do you see them like sort of uh, um, learning new information, uh, gaining some insight about Bitcoin? Like, is there is the conversations progressing? Because I fully agree with you. 
Um, I think ESG is really important for this administration. And right now I'm like getting a little worried that, um, you know, a lot of the myths are going to like uh, keep increasing. And even now we're starting to see investors um, not buy into Bitcoin because they're worried about ESG. So I really do think um, that this is one of the biggest hurdles that right now our industry is facing. Yeah, so so I can um, start quickly. I will say uh, my engagement with most um, staffers and frankly, most of the three letter agencies um, in, in, you know, the U.S., they are intellectually curious, they're engaging, they're trying to understand. But at the same time, you know, there are a large number of other issues that they're dealing with, including um, global pandemic and massive amounts of debt and, and money printing. Um, so I think just in terms of prioritization, it, it's sometimes challenging. For us, this feels like a really high priority, but but for them, it's, it's one of many important topics. Um, in terms of the ESG narrative, I'm actually really, really optimistic that in the next few months, we'll see some really cool new things coming to market um, that are going to help investors alleviate those concerns. Um, again, you know, as we've discussed several times, there is already policy in place of corporates buying carbon offsets to offset their emissions and their footprint, as well as consumers. You know, when you fly, you can buy a carbon offset to offset the emissions generated by your travel. Um, so we're working on bringing that to the Bitcoin industry. Um, I'll obviously share more on that when when there's more to share, but there are a number of companies that are really actively working on making that option available. At the end of the day, I think it's an individual choice. If you as an investor have a mandate to have a carbon neutral investment policy, um, and we as the industry can provide you with those options, but the burden is is, is not on, on us, right? It's really on the investor who wants to make those allocation decisions. And so I'm optimistic that, again, in the next few months, we'll see investment vehicles emerge that couple Bitcoin with the appropriate amount of carbon offsets um, to give investors not just the, the comfort that they're complying with their ESG mandate, but also hard data around um the hash rate that's that's utilized by the Bitcoin they own and an easy way to, to translate that into an offsetting um, carbon credit purchase. So more to come. But again, you know, this is a matter of economics and markets are fantastic at creating economic solutions to to problems. Um, the energy market is, <laughs> is a great example <laughs> of that, right? We literally created a multi-trillion dollar market um, to help manage the volatility of energy supply and energy prices. Um, and, you know, there's no reason that Bitcoin won't have similar financial instruments and derivatives and offsets that will allow people to do the same. Yeah, it seems like that's coming sooner than later. Um, and just a, a shameless plug, I mean, we're trying to convene conversations like this to bring together thought leadership to help provide great education on these topics. So this is going to be a podcast on Spotify and iTunes in, I don't know, a few hours or sometime very quickly. So uh, Money Movement Podcast, let people know about this episode, share it with people, uh, share it with, with folks who are not in this industry, share it with people who might have, um, you know, sort of the classic FUD uh, thrown around on this. Um, and, and, and maybe with that, I, I, I want to wrap up. Um, this has been a really great conversation, Nick and Meltem. Just deeply appreciate the breadth of knowledge that you guys bring on these subjects and many other subjects, obviously. Uh, but it's it's just a great pleasure to have you on and um, such an important discussion and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation as we go forward here. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, um, for hosting these discussions. And Nick, um, I look forward to reading more of your research. Yeah, just as a coda, I mean, you don't, we don't, to the audience, we don't actually have to be that optimistic. There's a lot of changes, structural ones underway in the North American mining market, which yeah. are going to change this picture for the better. And I can absolutely attest to that. Yeah. Um, no, not all of it is, is, is public yet, but it's absolutely happening. Um, so the, the picture is getting much rosier by the month here. Yeah, it, it, it's super exciting. Um, we'll be tweeting it out. <laughs> um, thank you guys. And, uh, and yeah, have an awesome night. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.